And today, as we go through Mark chapter 9, I, I want to stop and point your attention to something that every one of us have seen at some point in our lives or another. Now, that thing that I'm referring to is a movie preview. Now, a movie preview is awesome if you're somebody who loves watching movies, okay? A movie preview, what they tend to do is they cut and edit together some of the most exciting moments from an upcoming movie in order to tease you and to tease me and make us want to go and watch whatever movie it is that will be coming out. I know you probably, like me, have had this experience where you've seen the perfect preview and you've gone to watch the movie and it's blown you away and you're like, whoa, I'm so glad I came to watch this movie. Now, there are other times where it seems like, unfortunately, the best part of the movie is only in the preview and you watch the preview and you think it's going to be an amazing movie, but then you go and the movie kind of is a letdown. Like We've all had those moments where we've had good good things come out of a preview and we've had kind of disappointing things come out of a preview. Well, the reason that I bring a preview up is the account that we're going to read today from Mark chapter 9 is a preview of eternity. The problem, though, with a preview of eternity is many of us see the preview and we only stop there. We want to, in other words, hang out at the good preview, but we need to realize that in between the preview and eternity, there's a lot of stuff that happens. As a matter of fact, that's what happens when we get in Mark chapter 9. You can see this story in Mark chapter 9, starting at verse 1, and it's actually a continuation of what we talked about in last week's message. And you can go and you can watch last week's message and find that there to kind of help pull together the context of today. In Mark chapter 9, verse 1, here's what we read. And he said to them, Truly, I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. See, this account is what's commonly referred to as the transfiguration. And the reason it's referred to as the transfiguration is because it says in verse 2 that he was transfigured before them. That word that's used for transfigured is where we get our English word for metamorphosis. And it's kind of the picture of like the caterpillar becoming a butterfly, this whole, this completely total change that occurs. And so what happens is Jesus starts this off by saying that there are some standing amongst these people that will not die until they see God's kingdom come with power. Now, what's he referring to there? Well, if you recall, as we talked about last week, Jesus has called all of the crowd around to him and he's talked to them about discipleship. And he said this, If anyone would be my follower, my disciple, they've got to deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow after me. And then he starts talking about about the kingdom of God coming in judgment. And he says, if anyone's ashamed of me and my words, I will be ashamed of him when the Son of Man comes in his glory and with the glory of the angels. Then, as he leaves that section, he says that there are some standing here that I'm talking to that will not taste death before the kingdom of God comes with power. And notice what Mark does in chapter in verse 2. He says, and after six days, six days later, he ties these two events together. And so the kingdom of God is shown in the transfiguration of Jesus, where they go to the top of this high mountain, the Bible says. And more than likely, this is Mount Hermon. And if you'll recall in the geography, Jesus is at the northern part of Israel. He's at an area referred to uh, called Caesarea Philippi, and that's at the foothills of Mount Hermon. So Jesus takes them up the top of this mountain. And uh, I think Hermon is like 9,000 feet tall, so it's a, it's a hike to the top of the mountain. And as they get to the top of the mountain, he actually takes, has taken with him only three of his disciples. Now, Jesus had 12 total 
close, intimate disciples that were his apostles. And from those 12, he typically would always take three of them aside and they would see Jesus on a deeper level of revelation. And the same is happening here. He's got Peter, James, and John, and they're together. And they see Jesus transfigured. The Bible says that his clothes become sparklingly white. As a matter of fact, when Matthew records this event, Matthew says that his face shines like the sun. I want you to picture that moment. Imagine yourself at the top of the mountain with Jesus and you see the glory of God shining in his face. What a powerful moment. See, the ultimate big picture of the transfiguration is to show us the glory of Jesus, the Son of God, the second personage of the Trinity. We see his glory shining in all its splendor. Something interesting happens when they're on top of the mountain. It says that there suddenly appeared with him Elijah and Moses. Now, Elijah and Moses were two popular figures in the Jewish uh, religion. Moses, as you'll remember, is the, the guy who led them away from Egyptian slavery. Moses was the man who's popular from the story of Exodus, and he led them. And Moses had an interesting encounter with God on top of a mountain, Mount Sinai. And that's where Moses would go to the top of the mountain, and God would speak. And that's where Moses received the commandments, the Ten Commandments. Now, if you're familiar with the story, you know that when Moses would come down the mountain, because he was in the presence of God, his face would shine. So we see this parallel here with Moses and his story, but also Elijah shows up. And Elijah is just as powerful of a figure in the the Jewish uh, religion, the Jewish mind. Elijah, as a matter of fact, many people think Elijah is, is actually potentially more prominent than Moses for this reason. Elijah is said to be the forerunner of the Messiah. Elijah is said to be the one who comes to be the preview of the Messiah, that he will announce the coming of God's Messiah, God's Savior, okay? Even in Malachi, it's prophesied that before the Messiah returns, before the Messiah comes, that that Elijah will show up. Even today, even y'all today in our modern day, When Jewish people partake of Passover, which is a a feast that happened during the time of Moses, when they partake of Passover, they leave a cup of wine and an empty spot at the table for Elijah to show up because it's believed that prior to Messiah coming, that Elijah will show up at the Passover meal. And so Elijah was a prominent figure, but check this out. Not only did Moses have an encounter with God on the mountain, Elijah had an encounter with God on the mountain. He had an encounter with God on two mountains, actually. One of them is Mount Carmel. Now, Mount Carmel is amazing. When I was in Israel, uh, I got a chance to go to the top of Mount Carmel, and it is amazing. You can see all over the country from there. It's beautiful. You can see this perfect panoramic view. Uh, You can see the Valley of Megiddo, where, where Armageddon is said to take place. You can look down and you can see towards Jerusalem and the and the 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 Sea of Galilee. It is just gorgeous there. But on top of Mount Carmel. Elijah had a battle with the prophets of Baal. You can read about that in 1 Kings. And what you see happening in that particular account is God shows up with fire. Now, fast forward a chapter or two, and Elijah is now on the run. And as he's on the run for his life, he runs to Mount Sinai, the same mountain that Moses was at where he received the commandments. And when Elijah gets to the top of Mount Sinai, He experiences the presence of God, not in a mighty wind, not in a hurricane, not in an earthquake. He experiences God's power and God's presence in what we've commonly referred to as a still, small voice. So both Elijah and Moses have these encounters with God on the mountain, and now they're appearing with God on the mountain. If you really look at this, there are a lot of things that happen here that are kind of paralleling and kind of tying together. And so these disciples see this happening and Jesus is being changed in front of them. Now go with me a little bit further in verses five and six. Verse five says this, and Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. 
I imagine that I would be terrified if I were on the mountain with Jesus and this were occurring as well. Like imagine experiencing this, imagine this encounter. And by the way, imagine what the other people at the bottom of the mountain experienced when they looked up and they saw this radiance. It honestly has a lot of, of hints that are reminiscent to what happened when Moses would go up to the top of the mountain. See, there would be thunder and lightning at the top of the mountain. It was a fearful experience. There was bright light at the top of the mountain. And so what happens is Peter looks and he doesn't know what to say. <clears throat> now, typically there are two responses when you don't know what's happening, when you're confused and you don't know what to do. Typically people will either just, just shut down and won't say anything at all, or they'll do the complete opposite. Some people like me just babble, babble, babble. They just can't stop talking. Well, Peter... He's a classic case of foot-in-mouth disease. He always talks. That's how Peter handles things, and I, I kind of identify with that personally. But it says that he goes, Master, like Rabbi, Teacher, this is great. Now, I, I want to build some, some, so let's build tents. Let's build tabernacles. Let's build a tent for Elijah, a tent for Moses, and a tent for you. We'll stay here on the mountain forever because this is an amazing experience. And I've noticed that that's what we do as followers of Jesus. And not just followers of Jesus. We honestly do that in every area of our lives. We, we try to build tents and stay in good moments. I, I think about with my kids, like my kids are growing up fast, y'all. I don't know about your kids, but I got a hunch your kids are the same way my kids are. Like it seems like just yesterday they were, they were being born and, and now like I'm a week away from having two eight-year-olds running around the house, and I'm just a handful of months away from having a four-year-old running around with them. Like, it has happened fast. And there are moments in my life where I just look at them, and I'm like, please stop growing. Y'all, my picture of heaven is, is just what we have right now. My kids don't get any older. My wife doesn't get any older, which she's not getting any older anyway. She's just getting better, babe. I love you. Uh, like, my picture of heaven is where everything stays right here and we just love this moment because I want to hold on to it. We, we tend to be like Peter. We tend to want to build tents and build tabernacles on the mountaintop. But the truth is we can't live our Christian life on the mountaintop only. The mountaintop is just a preview of what is to come. The ultimate mountaintop that you and I are, are, are going to live on in eternity is the mountaintop where we will be transfigured and that mountaintop is eternity in heaven with Christ. See, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death, but there's a free gift from God, and that's eternal life through Christ Jesus. John's gospel teaches us that in him, in Jesus, was life, and that life was the, check this out, light of all men. And so just as the light of Jesus was shining on the Mount of Transfiguration, if we come to Jesus and repent of our sins and follow him, if he becomes the savior of our lives and the cleanser of our iniquity, if we come to him, then the Mount of Transfiguration that we will live at forever is the mountain of eternity. But friends, that's not where we live today. We still have to come down the mountain. We still have to come down the mountain. Peter says, Jesus, let's stay here. This is a good place for us to be at, for they were terrified. I just want to tell you, there are no tents allowed. We, we've got to be careful that we don't miss what God wants to do because we're clinging hold of what God is doing. Now, it's important for us to live in the moment, but it's not important for us to memorialize the moment. In, in other words, enjoy what's happening now, but don't let what's happening now stop you from what God wants to do in the future. All we have is the present, so live in the present don't cling to the present once the present becomes the past. Let's go a little further in verses 7 through 10. It says this, And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen, until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead might mean. I want you to notice what happens here. Two things. A cloud surrounds them, and out of that cloud comes the voice of God. 
Now, this again is reminiscent to what happened with Moses and the children of Israel. A cloud came down to the top of the mountain and God spoke to Moses from the cloud. And now there's a cloud on top of the mountain and God is speaking to Peter, James, and John. And he's saying to them what he had already said to Jesus at his baptism. This is my beloved son. I'm so pleased with him. Listen to him. This is heavenly validation. And I just want to stop and say this, that there are times and places in our lives where we have to rely on the validation of God. It's not that we have the validation of man. It's that we trust and rely that God is speaking words over our life. This is that moment where before God's voice only came to Jesus at the baptism, Now God's voice is going to others, and it's validating Jesus in the eyes of others. I just want to stop and say this as well. Stop trying to validate yourself so much. Stop trying to self-promote. Stop trying to get people to trust in you and believe in who you are, and just let God speak to them on your behalf, okay? Like, Like, your role in life is not to convince people to be on your team. Your role in life is to follow after God, seek first his kingdom, and let all the other things take place of themselves. See, Jesus is on the mountain and this cloud shows up and God speaks. This is my son. Listen to him. And then notice this, guys. Pay attention to this. It says, and then looking around, they no longer saw anyone. Suddenly, just like that, Moses is gone. Elijah's gone. The cloud's gone. And the only thing that's left is Jesus. I want to encourage you. When you have whatever is a Moses in your life or whatever is an Elijah in your life or whatever is a cloud in your life, we need to learn to get to the point to where, we dis- to where we pull and distill all of those things away from our lives and we can focus on Jesus and Jesus only. See, we're called to be followers of Jesus. We're not called to be followers of Moses. We're not called to be followers of Elijah. By the way, some people think that the reason that it's Moses and Elijah that show up on the mountain is that Moses represents the law. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and that Elijah represents the prophets, which would be Isaiah, Ezekiel, Nahum, all of the prophets. And that, in other words, Jesus fulfills the law and the prophets. Many people think that that's part of why they show up. Mark doesn't tell us why they're there, but one thing we do know is that Mark does tell us that eventually all the disciples saw was Jesus. Friends, I, I am living my life hoping and praying that I can encourage you to see Jesus and Jesus only. That when you look at your spouse, you don't see all the things that they do wrong, you see Jesus in them. That when you look at your kids, you don't see all the places where they aggravate and agitate you, you see Jesus in them. When you look at your jobs, you don't see all the things that are going wrong and all the people that are getting promoted and all the ways that they're overlooking you and all the ways you're overworked and underpaid, but you see Jesus in it. See, what would our lives look like if everything else was vanished from our vision and we saw Jesus only. Now notice what the voice from heaven says. This is my son. Don't just look at him. Listen to him. See, one of the things that we have in our society is we have the God knows my heart syndrome. And friends, let me tell you, God does know your heart. It's desperately and deceitfully wicked. That's what Jeremiah 17 teaches us. But thankfully, God's word tells us that when we come to Christ, that he takes out the heart of stone and places it, replaces it with a heart of flesh. But what is our role in this? To listen to Jesus. So when Jesus says, forgive your enemies, what do we do? We forgive our enemies. When Jesus says, pray for your enemies, love your enemies, what do we do? We pray for them, we love them. When Jesus says to not let your right hand know what your left hand is doing when you're giving, in other words, don't give so people can see what you're giving, but actually give so you can give in secret to bless people. What are we going to do? We're going to listen to Jesus. And then they, they come down the mountain and Jesus tells them, don't tell anybody what you saw. This preview, guys, was just for you three. It was just for you, Peter, just for you, James, just for you, John. Don't tell anybody else until I've risen from the dead. And it says that they didn't understand. This section of Mark's gospel, starting with the confession of Peter that we talked about last week, on up through through almost the end of chapter 10, Jesus has what is referred to as passion predictions. Now, a passion prediction is when he predicts that he's going to go to the cross. And he does three of them. 
And it seems like every time Jesus tells his disciples that he's going to suffer, he's going to die, and he will be raised to life, it seems like every time he tells them that, they just don't understand. And it says even here that they didn't understand what he meant. <clears throat> and then verse 9, uh, I'm sorry, not 9, verse uh, 11 says this. And they asked him, why do the scribes say that he... Uh, and they asked him, why did the scribes say that first Elijah must come? And he said to them, Elijah does come first to restore all things. And how is it written of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I tell you that Elijah has come, and they did to him whatever they pleased, as it is written of him. See, what you'll notice is that during this time, from, from really the end of Mark chapter 8 until the end of Mark's gospel in chapter 16, Jesus is singularly focused on going to Jerusalem and going to the cross. It's as if the first half of this gospel is teaching us who Jesus is, and the second half of the gospel is teaching us what Jesus came to do. And what Jesus came to do is to go to the cross for the sins of humanity. That's your sins, friend. That's my sins. And if we're not careful, we will try to stay on the top of the mountain. And as long as Jesus stays on top of the mountain, he doesn't make it to the cross. And if Jesus doesn't make it to the cross, your faith and my faith is futile. If Jesus doesn't make it to the cross, we're still in our sins. If Jesus doesn't make it to the cross, our debt hasn't been paid. If Jesus doesn't make it to the cross, then redemption hasn't been secured. But let me tell you something. Not only did Jesus come down that mountain... Jesus went to the cross. He suffered for you and he suffered for me. He became my substitute and your substitute. The penalty that we could never overcome, Jesus did for us. He overcame that on our behalf so that as we come to him in faith, as he's drawing us to him and as we respond to him in faith, we can say that we don't have to look forward to a tabernacle, to a, a tent on a Mount of Transfiguration on this side of eternity, but we have all of eternity to look ahead to, that we have life and we have life abundant to look for, and we have been made right with a holy God. See, they're coming down the mountain and they're talking about Elijah because, yeah, they just saw Elijah. Why must Elijah come and what's happening? And, and notice Jesus. He says, well, yeah, Elijah does have to come. Now, Elijah was really John the Baptist. That was <clears throat> John the Baptist coming in the spirit of Elijah. Now, maybe you're going, well, that, he doesn't say the spirit of Elijah. Okay, well, then Elijah was just on the top of the mountain, so Elijah did come first. See, Jesus ties it to the cross. Yeah, Elijah's going to come. He already did, and, and, and he suffered. But notice, so is the same thing going to happen to the Son of Man. See, we see that Jesus always is pointing things and tying things back to the cross. Why? The cross has the final word. And so Jesus was saying to them, guys, it's not about what's happening on top of this mountain. Rather, it's what's going to happen on top of the hill of Golgotha, the hill of Calvary, where I will give my life, the Son of Man, for the sins of the world. And so I want to ask you today, are you clinging to a mountaintop experience? Are you holding on to it trying to get the most out of it? Or are you embracing the cross? Or are you leaning into Jerusalem? Are you looking ahead to that life that is to come? Are you looking for God's kingdom? And are you looking for God's kingdom through a cross? So Jesus didn't stay on top of the mountain and neither can we. Jesus didn't stay in this transfiguration, glorious moment and neither can we. See, ultimately, We've all got to come down the mountain. And just as Jesus taught us and we talked about last week, we all have to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him. But he who seeks to lose his life for Jesus and for the gospel, that's the one that will save it. And so what am I saying all of this to you for today? Well, here's the point. Don't hold on to anything tighter than you hold on to Jesus. Don't hold on to anything any tighter than you hold on to Jesus. Listen, it don't hold on, don't build a tent on top of a mountain when God's got so much more for you in the journey to the cross. Don't hold on to anything any tighter than you hold on to Jesus. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, 
thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus. God, I pray that we would all fall at the mercy of the gospel today. We declare our sinfulness. We declare our need for a Savior, and we welcome you into our lives to save us, God, to bring us to redemption. And God, every place in our lives where we've tried to hold on to a glory on top of a mountain, every place where we've tried to build a tent for a temporary moment, God, help us to let go of that. Help us to, to take the tent up and be willing to come down the mountain into this world, into the places where you're calling us to, and help us to lean toward the cross. Lord, I pray for those that are watching that are followers of you, that you would strengthen their faith, that you would help them to embrace the cross life, that you would help them to be okay letting the tabernacles go and seeing Jesus and Jesus only. And Lord, I pray for those that are watching that don't have a relationship with you, that you would draw them even closer to you today. Let them know how much you love them and how much we love them. And God, we fall at the mercy of Jesus, acknowledging by faith that the same God who brought us this far is the God who will continue to bring us even farther. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.